Um programa chamado Fundo Escola serve hoje de base para grande parte da política educacional brasileira. A pedido da Fundação Lehman, o professor Matt Andrews, da Harvard Kennedy School, fez um estudo de caso sobre o Fundo Escola que foi apresentado hoje em São Paulo. Mr. Andrews, uh, I'd like you to start uh, explaining what Fund Escola is about. Thank you. Uh, very simply, it's a program to improve the functionality of Brazil's schools, especially in the poorer areas and especially in the north and the northeast. Uh, in the late 1990s and the early part of this decade, we're coming to uh, the end at the moment, you had Brazil having huge success in getting students into the schools. But then a lot of questions were raised about the quality of the education that they were receiving. What were the teachers teaching them? How good were the teachers? Uh, and you started to see inequality between some of the wealthier schools and some of the poorer schools and the wealthier parts of the country and the poorer parts of the country. So Funda Scola essentially focused on the school as the area where you needed to improve education the most. And it tried to introduce structured management in the schools so that schools started to plan, so that schools started to use structured syllabi. Uh, that uh, teachers had structured ways to think about their careers, that uh, they were all motivated in similar ways by the principals. In some ways you could say you were trying to introduce a kind of a business model into schools so that schools worked in similar ways and that they were focused on producing the highest quality education for the child. Some of the other dimensions that are interesting is the fact that it brought a lot of autonomy to the schools. So beforehand, a lot of the focus on education came through the federal government, through the state, and through the municipality. The money came through those areas as well. And the schools were really the receivers of orders on how to do things. Whereas Fundescola said, look, why don't we take the municipality out of the equation and move the money directly to the schools so that the schools can tell us what they need and they can tell us how they're going to perform. Very importantly, it also introduced uh, parents into the equation. So in order to get the money, what the schools needed to do was they needed to develop plans and strategies and they needed to involve parents in doing that so that you would get a very locally specific idea on what you wanted to spend the money on. This also increased accountability for the schools so that schools would be accountable for the parents because the parents can see whether or not a new teacher is hired or if uh, the roof has been repaired. So the kinds of things you would ask money for, the parents would have been involved in defining what the problem was and the need, and then they'd also be the ones who would be watching to see if it was actually improved. So that's kind of a, a very uh, simple rendering of what uh, Fundescola was about. And to make this teaching case, uh, you and your team have interviewed teachers, school directors, municipal and, secre and state secretariat. Uh, did Fundescola work it or failed in these places you visited from the talks you had with these people? It, it varied a lot and this was really interesting. Uh, in some places you would go to the same city and you would go to two different schools. So in Fortaleza for example, uh, in one school the school said, you know, we've always tried to plan and we've always tried to manage but we didn't know quite how to do it. And what Fundescola did was it gave us all the templates, it gave us all the questionnaires, it showed us how to do it perfectly. So it's perfect for us. Now we have the way to plan, and when we plan, we get more money. Uh, and so they said, you know, we, we've just become a better school than we were. But the key thing was that they were already a, quite a good school. In the same city, you go to another school and the person says, you know, uh, Fundescola was meant to uh, give us management improvement. And what it did was it created a management catastrophe. And the reason is that the principal says, you know, we never planned before. We don't have people on our staff who can plan. We have so many students and we have so much time that we need to spend in the classroom. We don't have time to plan. We don't have time to do our own accounts. These used to be done by the municipality. Now they have to be done by us and we just aren't ready for it. And I think that that's probably the key message from our work is, is you need readiness for change. You need space for change. And in some places where you have the readiness and you have the space, the content of Funda Scholar worked very, very well. In other places where you didn't have the readiness for change, the problem is that Funda Scholar did nothing to produce the readiness. 
It did nothing to build the space in the poorer areas. And that's the key, the key problem and the, probably the saddest part is in all of the, the, the schools that we did visit and the stories we told, the places where Fonda Scholar did well were precisely not the places where it was focused on, on, on changing things, the poorer schools. The poorer schools where you had less human resource capacity, where you had less strong leadership, where you had less engagement with the parents. Well, they still have those three things a lot worse than the others. And actually what happened was that Fonda Scholar became a burden for them and they simply couldn't overcome it. So the content of Fonda Scholar was really, really interesting, was really important and was very good. Um, but in some places the content almost seemed to be ahead of the context. And there was nothing in the program to improve the context, which is really, I think, where Brazil's challenge is. Yeah, so what you're saying is that context matters a lot. Context matters. Context in poor areas, uh, in areas that are behind, context is the defining thing. You can have the best reform in the world, but they can't use the reform, and the reform will actually stretch them even further than they are, and it can make things worse. Uh, now, I don't think we saw anywhere where we think that Fonda Scholar necessarily made things worse. But certainly, it would have been wonderful in some of these poor areas if we had heard some stories of real ways in which the ground had been prepared before Fonda Scholar had been introduced. And we just don't, didn't see much of that. It would be interesting to see if that's happening now through uh, the federal government. Um, which is another thing to note is that, you know, this is a very complicated uh, initiative because education is complicated. It involves the federal government, the state government, the municipal government. It involves principals and teachers and teachers unions and it involves parents. And you almost need all of these groups to be working together for this reform to work because this brings in a new form of incentives. It makes people think differently about how their work is. And one of the things we also observed was that in most cases Funda Scholar isn't the only thing that's happening. There are things happening all over, changes and reforms. In some places, the principals and the teachers said, you know, we're unsure which one we should follow. And we're unsure, you know, who is really in charge. Uh, and that creates uncertainty. And when you want people to change, you need to be very clear about how you want them to change, or else they will just resist everything that you ask them to do. Mm -hmm. You've mentioned at various levels of uh people that work with that, right? Uh -huh. uh, teachers and the uh, schools and there are uh, secretaries. How important is leadership in these levels for a policy to work? Leadership is absolutely, absolutely vital. And I think the interesting lesson is so much, it's not always about the leader, but it's about leadership, which means it's about multiple leaders working together. So, you know, multiple leaders who may do different things, but it's not really good enough if you have one vibrant teacher or even one vibrant uh, secretary working in the municipal level. You need to have a vibrant secretary and a vibrant uh, principal and a, and a teacher, for example, who are talking together, who are in a dialogue. Uh, a lot of change happens when you have a discussion amongst these people. I like to call them institutional entrepreneurs. Uh, and they are people who bring ideas into new places, who give people the authority to move with those new ideas, who build the acceptance for those new ideas and who also provide the necessary abilities that people can that people require to 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 do these uh, do these new 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 initiatives um, and and this requires leadership it requires leadership that is courageous it requires leadership that communicates to people that there is a need for change and that this is the right change and that supports this and says we're going to do it uh, and then when the people run into some trouble that supports them, that gives them the authority, over here you had a real change. You know, you took authority away from the, the municipalities and you gave it to the schools. Uh, but in some cases we found there was some uncertainty about that because the leadership wasn't strong enough in saying, look, this is real, you know. So the municipalities now have got to support the schools. But not, you need someone to tell the municipalities, this is your new job now. And you need the schools to say, look, you need to take authority. You need to actually exercise that authority. This is all about leadership. Mm -hmm. from, from what you are saying, I understand it's very important for people that are thinking about public mm -hmm. policies uh, to think about the different levels uh, of organizational structures you have when you uh, 
make a public policy when you want to implement it and you want it certainly to work. Absolutely. And, and, and in this you see the three levels. In organizational theory we say basically there's three. The one is the individual, it's the social psychological level. And when you're talking about change, individuals are important because they go through a journey of change. So, you know, we have really interesting interviews in the case with teachers and some of the teachers would say things like, you know, we've seen change before but we didn't really know. Sometimes they're skeptical and they say maybe we can wait it out and we don't have to do anything. We can see if it'll go away. In other cases, the individuals are saying, you know, we are so tired, we're so overworked. And you need to pay attention to that level. On the other hand, you have individuals working together in organizations and these are schools, municipal secretariats, state secretariats. Uh, there are a lot of different entities involved and you know these uh, entities have got their own interests and they've got their own issues when they go through change and then the third level is the broader environment where you start to speak about the political climate and you start to speak about the economic climate um, and, and, and you can't just conceptualize a reform happening at the individual or at the organization, which is what Fundaskola did. Fundaskola looked at the, the individual schools and it tried to change them without taking into consideration what the context looks like. So the context would involve things like the labor market. You know, how many professionals do you have who understand these kinds of business techniques involved uh, in Fundaskola when you are talking about some small villages in the northeast? And we went to some of the small villages and, you know, it was hard to find anyone, not only in the schools, but anyone in any kind of industrial setting or any kind of uh, business who, who knew how to use the kind of planning tools that you have in Fundaskola. Now, if your community isn't used to planning, if your community isn't used to formal accounting, um, it's very hard to find someone who can do it in a school. So your environment becomes very important. And then, of course, politics becomes important. And we saw the impact of a change in the political sphere uh, that, that, that really rocked things. You know, you obviously went through a change federally, um, and uh, which actually cha stopped Pandascola for a period of time. Um, but even apart from that, you know, you, you, you found, we heard lots of stories about changes where uh, the, 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 the mayor would change and the mayor would change the director of the school. And the director had been very, very uh, uh, um, uh, favorable towards Fundaskola and now you have a new director who doesn't know anything about planning and who doesn't know anything about Fundaskola and everything falls down. Um, and we, we saw that again and again. So the context is very, very important, the environment in which the reform takes place. And what's the, the best way to evaluate the policies and to understand what the outcomes and the impacts are? This is really, really a good question. And the case can be used to think about this question. And it's very, very difficult to evaluate Fundaskola in some senses because it tries to change the inputs you use to manage. So it tries to give you a new planning document or a new mission statement. And uh, we know that thousands of schools now plan. And we know that thousands of schools now have mission documents. But how it then changes perhaps the outputs, uh, the way in which teachers are teaching in classes, or the outcomes, the quality of the students who are coming out, or whether it has impact in terms of uh, being able to ensure that you have the kinds of people coming out of schools who can move Brazil forward. We don't know because there's a time gap there. And this is going to be one of the challenges that Brazil has in terms of evaluating its educational policies moving ahead. Because in the late 1990s, you didn't have a big time gap. What you were trying to do was get more children into schools. And you could measure that every year. How many more children do we have? But now you have a much more complicated thing to measure. Um, when I taught this in class and I said this this morning, what my students who are not from Brazil said is, you know, Brazil needs to be looking at whether or not its students are performing at the level of OECD countries. Because Brazil is now moving away from being a developing country to being a more developed country. Um, but you'll only see those results maybe in five years' time. So you have to think very carefully as to how you evaluate this kind of reform in the meantime. Now, one of the things that I think is the best form of evaluation is whether or not the ideas in Fundaskola are being picked up by people who may not even know about it. And we saw this in a couple of cases where people, we would interview them and we'd say, tell us about how work is. And they'd say, you know, it's amazing. We're planning now and we have this mechanism to learn better. And we're learning from all the mistakes of the past. And actually our school is functioning a lot better than it did before. And then you ask them about Fundaskola, they haven't heard about Fundaskola. 
but they're using all the Fundus Scholar planning documents and the mechanisms and all of those kinds of things. At the same time, a lot of the reforms that have been picked up by the new government are not called Fundus Scholar anymore, but they have many of the same dimensions of Fundus Scholar. So in a sense, I think that that may be the best way to see whether Fundus Scholar has worked or not, whether people are thinking differently about their jobs. And I think there is evidence that in some places that is the case. Okay, very good. And you are uh, a specialist in mm -hmm. public policies, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what does the education sector in Brazil can gain with the culture of studying and evaluating its programs and its policies? You know, I think one of the key things that we learned in Fundus School Land from any kind of public policy is that you can have a lot of good content in your reform, but you need to implement it. And that sometimes is where all the trouble begins. Uh, there are many, many good ideas in the public and the private sector that, uh, that, that fail because they aren't implemented very well. And in order to implement, I think you need to evaluate on an ongoing basis for two things. The first one is you have to learn. Implementation is never a linear process. You never know exactly how things are going to work out. So you have to actually get a lot of information all the time to kind of tell you where you're going and tell you what your next step should be and to learn about kind of what the mistakes are because the process is really going to be like a crooked line and you're going to be moving in all sorts of directions and you won't know those directions unless you have the ability to evaluate and to be able to tell you some lessons from the story. So you know my feeling is if if policymakers were to look at some of these cases now and to go and speak to people who are trying to implement, they would learn some very interesting lessons about where it's going right and where it's going wrong that would help them to change their strategy a little bit so that the good idea could actually be successful. The other thing that evaluation helps is it helps to build accountability. If people know that they are being evaluated in a fair way, people are motivated to do what you're asking them to do. If they know that it's going to be regular and that they know what you're going to be looking at, they will focus on those things. Now, this can be bad because they may focus on those things, but not on the other things. Um, but it certainly gets them their attention to implement the policy. If you're not evaluating it, what often happens is that the people think, well, this will go away, so we don't need to do it. Because, you know, the next government's going to be here in two years' time, and then they'll change the policy anyway. And that's probably the third thing I should, I should mention is, if you evaluate it, you have a better chance of institutionalizing it, which means that it survives through changes in government and it survives through changes in the, in the economy. Because as people evaluate and they get information about what they're doing, they also start to own it a lot more. And they start to say, gee, this is something that we actually want to do. And they see the data and they see the information about how their lives are improving. So this is not just a lesson for education or for Fonda Scholar. It's for policymaking generally. And unfortunately, these two things, implementation and evaluation, are often very, very poorly treated in the public sector. People don't think about them. They get very excited when they get a new program or a new reform, or when they get a new budget and they're given more money. But then when they get the money, they don't really know how to spend it. And so the reality becomes a lot of international projects and even a lot of budgets around the world are underspent, not overspent, because people don't know how to implement. And then they get to the last month of the year and they just spend the money on anything. You want people to, to move from a, an old thing to a new thing. And you want them to do it in a way that they end up doing the new thing. Uh, that's what we would call institutionalizing. But you need to evaluate so that you, you, you force or you encourage that movement. Uh, if you don't do it, then you're not going to institutionalize it. And the problem is if you don't institutionalize the change, then every time you have a change in government or every time you have a change in the economy or a change in the director at the school or a change in the uh, secretary in the municipality, things change. And what you end up with is a country that is constantly changing but never institutionalizing any of its change. And evaluation can help you see exactly where you are and kind of bring your change into perspective. So I think there is a lot of room for Brazil to improve in that direction. <laughs> yeah, right? Absolutely.